In this episode of Undictated, we get to meet Mary Villacazi, a trailblazer, the new group chief executive of the most valuable financial services group in Africa. Quite a lot on her plate um, and quite a different ch- uh, appointment to what we heard from NASPAS very recently, where the CEO left immediately and the new CEO walked in on the day of the announcement. They do things differently at first strand. We'll find out why. Do you feel like a trailblazer this morning, Mary? This has been, it's kind of been coming for five years, but uh, it's a big day that you've now, the announcement's been made. You, you only take over on the 1st of April. Do you, do you kind of feel responsibility, the weight of responsibility, given that uh, this is a big deal, the first black female CEO of a major banking and financial institution in, in South Africa? Morning, Alec, and thank you for having me on your show. Um, I have certainly felt uh, the huge responsibility that comes with the role from the time that I was informed of the decision by the board um, to endorse me and to entrust me with leading this um, prestigious um, and an institution that I hold in high regard. So it does come with a lot of responsibility, but I I am very Pleased with the the caliber of the people really that that surround me. I'm pleased with um, with the support from the board. Um, you know, strong leadership team. I guess all of those. Um, at, even though the 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 buck stops with me or will stop with me when Alan um, officially leaves, um, I, but I've got a very strong team that I'll be working with. And I mean, I suppose Alec, you know our history with, you know, with with how we run the we run the group. You know, a lot doesn't change. Um, so I guess my big job is really to make sure that the ground is solid and we continue to just steady this big ship. Well, to, to get context, because that's what Undictate is all about, and we want to get a bit of context on you and your journey, but maybe we start with First Rand. It was started, created by uh, the big three, the three musketeers, G.T. Ferreira, Larry Dipinar, Paul Harris. They instilled a very different culture into the group. Does it still continue? Do you still have that entrepreneurial uh, outlook on life within First Rand? Very much so, Alec. I guess the, I mean, I guess when you look at the successes of the group, you can see how they were anchored deeply into the business philosophy. So the owner-manager culture is still at the heart of um, of, of, of our culture. Um, we now have what we call First Rand promises and, and really their premise is still much that um, you know, believing in talented people, getting exceptional people, giving them, I think, a sense of a mandate and ownership, and really just entrusting them to deliver. And and I guess that recipe continues to, you know, I think it continues to bear fruit. Um, it's certainly very attractive to even newer talent. So yeah, it's I think it's a heritage we're very proud of. Um, and really, I suppose our responsibility as a leadership team is to continue to build on that. Um, and Actually, when I started um, in 2018, I think there was a survey done in the group to, for people, you know, to, I think, express what they valued about First Ren and what they would like to see change from a culture point of view. And it's so interesting that across all our jurisdictions, we still came back, I guess, to this culture. Um, and that's what informed the First Ren um, promises, but based on the philosophy that had been part of First Ren heritage. So, yeah, I think we're very proud of that and something that we believe is distinctive um, and continues to attract talent. So just grateful for everybody that planted the seeds for us to enjoy the trees today. Why did you come over in 2018? Because you were, you were poised, I'm sure, for bigger things at MMI while you were the deputy CEO. Um, and then you left the insurance company where you, you had been a non-executive director, which is also interesting. Uh, you seem to to do your homework where you are, and then going across to first round was there were there promises made? Because at the time, Alan Pullinger told the board, "We understand that he would be there for six years and he'd be gone." So did they say, "Mary, this is your chance. Come across, and you can actually run a much bigger ship than the one that you probably would be running in the insurance industry." 
No, Alec, I think if that was the case, I think my life over the last couple of years might have been different. So I joined actually um, First Rand and it was after a couple of phone calls. It wasn't um, an immediate, oh, this is an obvious move I should make. Um, but I joined really for the opportunity to get into banking um, because I would have probably, you know, I would have operated at a similar level at, at MMI, which I was really quite familiar with. But I guess an opportunity to join such a big institution and to get into something that's different was really quite attractive. Um, as well as actually an opportunity of working closely with Alan Pullinger, who I held in high regard. And I've always, you know, obviously from the links with, uh, with that momentum had with First Rand, I've always been exposed to the culture and the leadership style at, at First Rand. And it really was an opportunity to be part of that team. So, you know, the portfolio seemed interesting. I mean, Alan said, you can look after the subsidiaries in broader Africa. You know, you get to have a more holistic sense of 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 of, of the different banks working with regulators, working with boards, um, and if and you, and you know that's obviously a very different um, role you play as a shareholder there. Um, and then I also there was a portfolio of um, insurance and investment management, which at the time played to my skill set, and I could contribute and shape those strategies. So. And then obviously just like leveraging on my experience, obviously with risk and compliance, those are kind of things that I, you know, I, I was already familiar with uh, having oversight on, you know, that made the rest of the portfolio. So it was really, I think, an exciting opportunity that I was given and I'm grateful I said yes. Um, but when you, when I joined First Rand, I mean, you know, I looked around, very, very solid senior people. I think what we are very privileged um, about is that I think on our Stratco, most of the people have been there for at least 20 years. So there are very experienced people at First Rent. So when I joined on day one, it was not my expectation that I would be here today. So my mindset was always that I'm here to learn. I really have been given a fantastic opportunity. And yeah, so just grateful for, for the board and for Ellen's sponsorship. Um, and And I guess this role could have been occupied by many more people within first rent. But obviously the board prioritized succession um, and orderly succession. You know, it's a team that's worked together for a long time. So I guess there are many factors that I suppose go into consideration when one makes changes like first rent has made. But you must have thought in the back of your mind, you're working closely with a CEO. He's going to leave after six years. Uh, step up to the plate and you could make history. I did. I mean, I suppose, you know, I always I always say what people need to be given is opportunities and a stage. Okay? And then it's up to them to perform or not, um, or do whatever it is that they do with the opportunity. So I I don't believe in squandering opportunities, um, and I did my best. But I have to say that I didn't always um, do what I did, um, you know, with the... Because I think if you spend all your time preoccupied about leadership succession, I think you lose out on moments. Um, and often my own experience has been that people have noticed me when I'm not, you know, when I, I'm, I'm not even thinking that they're noticing me. So over my career, I've learned to just, you know, use whatever opportunity I have, do things to my best, um, and then the the doors open up. So so I haven't, you know, so I suppose I, I really use every opportunity to learn, um, to partner with, with Ellen. He gave me lots of exposure to a lot of the relationships, stakeholder relationships that I would need to manage. Uh, but but Alec, I think there were always other contenders. So I, I never was complacent, but I really enjoy what I do. So it's not that I have to think about this and what's going to happen next on a daily basis. Was Jacques Celia another contender? We see there's a switch in his portfolio now. Look, it would be hard for me to say who was a contender because I guess that's a be that's a board managed process. And so they would know how many other names. I might just be aware that there were five. I wouldn't know who the names are, um, rightfully so. So I guess that's a that's a decision made by by the board. Um, and maybe Ellen recommends they also have their own ideas on you know who they think should lead the organization. So I wouldn't know. But what I would say is that um, I mean, Alec, you would be familiar that in first rent, um, and I suppose the history that started a long time ago around looking at the time you've been in the role. We believe in refreshing seats. You know, people rotate often, take on different roles because 
you get new energy, new perspective. Even if people still have the energy, you know, they're just being given a different challenge um, and, you know, gives other people opportunities. Um, and, and I suppose that's a tradition that we've had um, for a long time. My time will also come when I need to look at how, to, how much time I've spent in the seat. So, yeah, Jacques had been in f and has been leading f and for 10 years. I mean, he's done very well. He still has a lot of energy, which is why he's been given um, a new mandate to try and solve for, you know, for a future business model, for more revenues. Um, and I really think it, we intend to leverage off the skills that he's had um, in this new role. And Jacques is a builder, so I... I, I'm really counting on the fact that he's going to build us something that we are proud of um, in time to come. But I won't steal his thunder because he's got some thinking to do, some work to do, and then he'll launch what um, he's, you know, he's he's going to be focusing on going forward. So yeah, so I'm grateful that we've got his skills still as part of the team, and I think also Harry going into F and B brings quite a lot of continuity because he's. As he says, he's looking too happy. He says he's going back home. So he's, um, you know, there's, there's that sense that he's been there. He understands the team. Him and I were always involved in the leadership selection of the people, you know, who will be reporting into him. So, yeah, so there's a sense of continuity and a new challenge for, for, for Jacques. What about the timing? And I'll ask this because in the excitement around your uh, appointment, it's almost been lost that the former CEO before Alan Pullinger, the guy who left when you arrived in 2018, is now going to be the person you're going to work closely with, the new chairman, uh, Johan Berger. That's an interesting change. Uh, Roger Jardine has been the chairman, clearly, uh, for some time. But now you're going to get another ex-banker, the person who has occupied the role that you have right now, who you're going to be working with presumably quite closely, as CEOs and chairmen do. So um, Johanna has been on the board um, for several years. I've observed Alan and Johan's interactions over the last couple of years because it's always interesting when somebody was in the seat um, and they're now sitting on the other side. And I have to say that I, mean, I think there's really huge maturity in, in, in the interactions of the, of, the, of, the, of the various professionals. I mean, I suppose... Um, you know, Johan was so you know was so conscious of the fact that he's now a non-executive director, um, and he would challenge. But I really think he was always so mindful of of I guess the the position and the power that still um, it you know is in, it is with him, even though as he's a non-executive director. And I think now he's fully transitioned to being a non-executive director. Uh, he looks far too relaxed to I think even have remnants of what an executive um, director goes through. So. Yeah, he's had a lot of time, I suppose, to transition, um, and and I guess I really see him as as um, as some. I've actually worked with Johan before when I was CEO of Balance Sheet Management um, at MMI, and Johan was chair of Balance Sheet Management when he sat on the board of Momentum. So I often used to come to First Rent and sit with Johan on the agenda, update him on the business, and he would provide some valuable advice and 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 coaching. So. Yeah, so I've got a relationship already, actually, that's been established when, you know, it was different roles, but um, um, but I guess it's a continuation of, of how I've worked with Johan before. And, I mean, I think for me, you know, having bankers and experienced seasoned bankers on a board is so critical. I just don't see how you do it as a CEO without people, you know, who challenge, who can deeply challenge management and the strategies and provide guidance. So I think we're so privileged as a management team to be able to have that kind of depth on the board. And I guess, you know, I think when they challenge us and they make us go back, we know it's always from a place of wanting us to do better or make or making sure that we think things through and thoroughly. So because they're a supportive board, you know, I think that challenge is so welcome. So I look forward to working with Johan Um you know, because he's he's been here. So, yeah, the fact that he's ex-CEO, I think I see a lot of other pluses that we benefit from as a team. And you've said that a few times now, team. Uh, knowing First Rand, uh, having watched the First Rand development from the early days, it is something that's very, very apparent in the business and the whole succession planning as we've discussed now. But the contrast then with what happened at NASPERS. Uh, Bob Van Dijk was in the role 
one morning we were called to an announcement and we were told by the chairman, because Becker, uh, Bob is gone. Uh, here's a new guy, Edwin too. He's the new CEO who nobody kind of knew. He'd, he'd been there for a while, but came from completely outside. That's very non-first Randy. Is that because you are a bank and they are a tech company? Look, I, I, I actually wouldn't know, but you know, I mean, I think the... I think succession planning has to be something that um, is, I suppose, thoroughly interrogated. The discussion that boards need to have all the time. I think that's certainly what we do in first round. Um, and I and I and I think the discussions, you know, Alan, even with this appointment already, just saying, look, I will give six years because I've already done twenty years with the group. I think is quite um, mature. I mean, actually, Johan in my interactions with him has said not. Ellen's date has never been up for discussion or up for debate. Um, but, you know, I think it's really, very really mature that you've got a board that understands how long they have with the CEO. And and I think, I guess, that's what provides, you know, provides the opportunity really for active succession. And also the fact that we look at time of, you know, the time in the roles, you know, it, it just really makes succession not a topic that comes once in a while um, or when an event has happened, but one that we really live to. So, yeah, so I, I, I mean, hopefully this is a tradition that we, 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 we up, um, keep going forward. Um, but I think it certainly provides a lot of stability in the organization. Have you also given a six-year term or are you approaching your position a little differently to what Alan did? Well, I'm 46, Alex, so, um, and I guess I don't think that there's a better job than the one that I have the privilege um, of, um, of, um, of getting into when I take over. So, yeah, I suppose with me, there's longevity. I have a lot of energy now. Um, I don't know what happens after a couple of knocks of um, navigating through certain crises. Maybe the time changes, but I'm, I should be here for quite some time. You know, I always say that, I mean, I've obviously got um, time and age on my side, but I mean, one has to always just check whether you are still relevant. Um, if that's organ the organization still requires your kind of leadership um, and leadership style. So, Maybe that's one opportunity for a checkpoint there. So I suppose I always have to listen well to what, um, you know, where the organization is at, whether I'm still enabling and leading the team well. And the second one will be just depending on the maturity of the succession. You know, so obviously my job is to make sure the board also has five people to choose from. And, where, and when they're ready, you know, I can't then sit just because I've got age and time on my side. I will need to step aside and give them an opportunity. So. So I suppose I see my my two checkpoints as those two critical ones, whether I'm still relevant or whether there are people that are ready to take over from me. Those are some wonderful insights into the CEO's role that so few people uh, get the window into. But the other role that you have is now going to be like, seriously, South Africa's power couple, you and Prof Zebulon. I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> that's going to be something... Um, I guess that that is going to push you more and more into the into the spotlight, given that he's uh, the head of uh, Vits and you now the head of First Rand. When you guys get home, do you not talk business? You stay away from business. No, we've got a, a eleven and a ten year old, um, ten year old um, girls in our lives. Um, other one is nineteen. She hardly gets a chance to speak. Uh, I think the show belongs to the ten and eleven year old. They put us in our place. Um, and, um, and yeah, I suppose when we get home, we are just like any other ordinary um, family. So, and I suppose we, and, and we, I guess we're not new in, in taking responsibilities. I suppose we've been doing it in different capacities from a very young age. So, yeah, so hopefully we're in a bit of a rhythm. But I also know that the role I'm going into is probably much bigger than the ones that I've taken in the past. Um, yeah, but I, I think we, we support each other. So that's, that's one thing that I, I think we know how to do. And we've got a very supportive structure around us and the people that work for us, um, my mother, our family. So I, I think we should have enough of a container to still keep us grounded. Your journey in business is, I won't say predictable, but if you want to become a CEO of a bank, it's not a bad idea to become a chartered accountant first, which is what you did. But going back a little before then, the school that you attended, I see it was in Japan Park, which even during that time in the 90s was not exactly, 
the, the, the place that one would have, well, it must have been quite challenging apart from anything else. So how did you end up there at, the, at, uh, at that school and indeed end up doing accounting? Yeah, no, thanks for taking me back there. Um, so I actually spent most of my schooling in Alex. Um, I went to primary school called Qatar Primary School, high school called East Bank High School. And then I left um, East Bank High School to join St. Andrews um, College. I always had to remind people at varsity that's not St. Andrews, it's St. Andrews. Um, and it was a small private school, um, maybe about 100 students, started by an Irish woman who came to South Africa and thought she could make a difference by getting a few people together and providing quality education to a few people who one day hopefully do the same, you know. So, and then um, the school outgrew its capacity in Bramfontein. It was like one floor of, of a building, um, outgrew the, the space. And um, the, 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 then there was a school that was unoccupied in, um, in Jubet Park. So the school started in Bramfontein, then we moved to Jubet Park. And you are correct. I mean, that was the 90s um, when I saw images recently of, um, of you know, um, what in Gata Freedom Party at the time in the 90s, that turbulence. I mean, my school was like right there. You know, there were times, there were certain times when you just had to stay at school because there was just too much happening outside. You couldn't leave. So it wasn't particularly a great neighborhood. But we had good teachers. You know, I think this, um, the commit, you know, the teachers who were there were there because they believed they can make a difference um, and educate some young minds. And, and they did. You know, and they also instilled in me that Sometimes all it takes is just one action, a few people, um, and you can achieve. And, and I suppose you can make, you know, you can play your role. So, yeah, so that was my schooling. And I actually wanted to become a psychologist. Um, well, firstly, I wanted to become a lawyer because I thought, you know, lawyers are never really out of work. But I quickly moved to something that grabbed my heart and I wanted to become a psychologist. I was discouraged by my teacher at the time. Um, I said, no, this is not really going to work. You're watching too much TV. People don't lie on couches and say they need help. In retrospect, I think she wasn't correct, but I probably ended up, I probably ended up, um, you know, I. one thing that I do as a leader is, you know, I'm so conscious of the fact that I can enable other people to lead. I can enable people to contribute. You know, I, I and, and really that is probably my sweet spot, working with leaders um, and developing people. So, Anyway, maybe I didn't deviate too much. I became a chartered accountant, but I still am back to really working with people. So that, that's been my, my journey from my career point of view in schooling. And you're very Joburg. And you look around in Joburg today at the politics and the, the craziness that's happening. Uh, your predecessor, Alan Pullinger, was, he's never held back when it came to speaking out. Are we going to have a different first round under Mary Villacazi, or are you also going to be... Uh, pointing out things, speaking truth to power, as it were, and pointing out where things can be improved. One thing about Alan is that he is very direct. I think you don't um, miss his point. It's very clear. Um, and he is um, a South African who's actually deeply passionate about the country and its potential. Uh, so obviously we've got very different com ways, different styles, different ways of communicating. Uh, but I, I think, you know, I guess the points that first rand often raises are uh, points that you know I think from a from a country point of view, I guess those are things that we see as opportunities, I suppose, that need to be taken by policymakers to make the country better so the country can grow and I think we can have the you know the kind of economic growth that we need to lift so many people from poverty and I think also to just get us on the right path. So I think they went personal views. I guess that is that is our role as a big, as a big systemic player in in the country. Um, and I guess where praise needs to be given to the government and the policymakers, uh, it's also our job to do that. Um, and where things can be done better. So I suppose, yeah, I suppose Alan's um, constructive criticism. You know, I suppose part of it maybe are his views, and he'll always say that. But I, I just think as a, as an institution, there are times when. When we lean in and we are part and parcel of a solution, and I suppose when we also express our views, because I guess it's also important um, for the wider society. Indeed it is, and you're a big investor in Johannesburg. 
uh, in even in the CBD with Bank City down there. But to, just to close off with, Mary, you are undoubtedly going to be asked by many people, especially young people who haven't seen uh, any possibility of of uh, the path to the to the center office or the corner office of the biggest financial institution. They're going to be asking you for advice. They're going to be asking you, what do I do? Do I go and find a, a St. Aldo's uh, that I, I go, and work, go and school in? How do I get to where you are if I'm ambitious, hardworking, and, of course, smart? Alec, I'd say, um, obviously, I guess the basics of education um, are, are critical. But I'm finding something, actually, that you are that you are passionate about is is probably an important starting point and and sometimes some finding something that is going to lead you. I mean, when I was sometimes studying auditing, it wasn't really, I couldn't say that that's my passion, but that's what I had to do. So sometimes balancing what you're passionate about with what you have to do, I guess, as, as a starting point, that's number one. Number two, using any opportunity that you find really to the best of your abilities. When I started my articles and I was in the auditing group, I actually wanted to be in the banking group, um, but that was not um, available. And, you know, I, I I actually performed very well and I started enjoying insurance. And, you know, most of my the doors that opened for me came from that. Now I could have got in there and sulked and, half, and showed up um, half-heartedly and really would have missed out on a lot of opportunities. And then the third one, I think, is to just always, you know, I think do your best job, you know, not when people are looking. I think doing the right thing, it being consistent, all those things are so important because I, even I'm amazed that actually the, some of the opportunities I've received from people who, you know, I didn't, that's not what I went there for. Um, and they come back and say, Mary, we saw you here. Would you like to do the following? So so just always remembering to just, you know, I think to excel wherever you are um, using any of the opportunities. And lastly, I would say, you know, I don't think people make it without sponsorships. So choosing your boss as well is like, I think, really very critical. Um, and surrounding yourself with people that want to see you succeed because nobody gets to where they get to alone. So yeah, so all those factors, it's many of them. And then obviously a supportive family. I mean, I think I always say you must choose your spouse well um, because those are the people that need to cheer you up most of the time. So, yeah, maybe those little six points would be my advice. Well, that wonderful story, uh, I think it is an African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. Mary Villacazi, the incoming chief executive of the First Rand Group, and I'm Alec Hogg from Business.com. Thank you.